Hello, everyone, and good evening. I am here with Diana Lom, who has started a movement that is just phenomenal. And I have took some of her courses, and she has greatly helped me in many, many ways. So without any further ado, Diana, tell me about how you came into practicing and educating with the Red Tent. So thank you, Buffy, for the introduction. And it's a joy to be here with you. We've known each other for a while, and it was great to travel a journey with you. Um, I started before the Red Tent book was written. So when I started, I called myself, my business was Red Moon and my work was menstrual empowerment. The Red Tent book was not yet written. I started in the early 1990s, 93, 94. And the way I started was that I was functioning greatly and happening. Everything was happening and I was happy with most of the aspects of my life at the time except for that once a month I became a basket case because my hormones were playing havoc with me and my symptoms were not physical as much as emotional I was very irritable and and explosive and wasn't able to be around people once a month because of my hormones my my menstrual cycle was was interfering with my or I thought I was it was interfering I realized I was interfering with it but I thought it was interfering with me and I decided to research how indigenous cultures have held menstruation because I couldn't believe that the that nature would create half of the human race to suffer every month. That just didn't compute. And I realized riches and depth of knowledge in indigenous cultures around the world, around menstruation. So the main thing that spoke to me, but there are many more wisdom nuggets from indigenous cultures, are, is that the time of the bleeding, the time of the menstrual blood is considered in indigenous cultures as the time when the veil between the world's things there is a thinness and an accessibility that women can reach the depth of the spirit world in themselves when they bleed in a way that any other time of the month they cannot. And I started delving into that and realized that there were moon huts and moon lodges in all continents, on all, uh, in all tribes, in all cultures, if you go back far enough, where... The cultures honored women for their need to renew and replenish themselves every month. And they would retreat from their daily chores. The men and the, all the children would take care of business. And the women would just go inward. They would become the shamans of their tribes. They became the oracles. They became the prophecies the prophetesses uh, who dreamt prophecies for their tribes. And people of the tribe would come and ask questions, either about the whole tribe's direction, the elders would come, or about people, individual's path. And there was a clarity that whatever the women dream in the moon hut or moon lodge when they're on their bleeding time is what pe the people accept because it was an understanding, depth of understanding that women can access wisdom in that time of their month that people otherwise cannot. So I'm going back to the realization that I was interfering with my cycle. Instead of withdrawing and renewing myself and recharging my batteries and allowing myself to allow the month that had ended to be released, and prepare for the new cycle, the new month. Instead of that, I was working, working, working as if it was the same day as any other day of the month. And I stopped doing that and my symptoms stopped because I realized that when I'm not in the face of people and I'm closing the door and taking time off, there isn't anyone to be, really, to be irritable with. There is only me. And it was a bliss of going inwards and dreaming my own prophecies and going into the depths of my soul and renewing myself. So that's how it started. And that was early 1990s. And like I said, it was not called the Red Tent at, at that time. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Mm. So how did 
how did you get started with working with other women? So at that time, I was working, I was already uh, certified as a group a counselor and, and a coach. And I was working with people already, but mostly co-ed. I worked with couples. And women around me in my life noticed that there was something different about me. And I was talking about how my symptoms dissolved. And women wanted to have the same experience for themselves. So I called my first menstrual empowerment circle in San Diego in 1993 or four after I've done this journey for myself and it was so profoundly touching to share with other women we all shared the story of our first blood we realized that for most everyone in the room it was the first time ever that women shared this story. We share with other women the stories of how we lost our virginity and stories of abuse and, and molestation and recovery and courage to heal. But in all of that, the story of the blood is often silent. No one talks about it. It's such a taboo that women have internalized and have not broken out of those taboos as we have through history broken through other taboos. So when there was such moving moments in that circle, I realized that I have to continue to offer this to women, that the coaching I was doing, the couples work that I was doing, there were many people who were experienced communicators in the field that I was in, but there was no one absolutely no one that was talking about menstruation and, and menstrual empowerment. So slowly I started shifting the balance away from the coaching and the relationship skills work and into the menstrual empowerment and that's how it started. I remember you telling me that menstrual blood is not supposed to smell bad that's and, true. and that it's not supposed to be painful. That's true. So could you tell me why it is painful for most women and, and why they do not appreciate their smell as if an, a normal human smell? So let me start with the smell. The odor, if we cut our finger, there is no smell to the blood. When the blood comes out of our womb, it has no odor other than the odor of your genitalia but no other odor. What produces the odor is the chemical reaction between the treated napkins, pads, reusable, disposable, disposable, not reusable. The reusable is where we, when we use reusable is where we find out it doesn't smell. But when we use disposable, those paper products, those hygiene products are treated with bleach and various other chemicals, including it's in some of them deodorants, deodorizing agent. And when the blood interacts with that, it, this is what produces the odor. So they have given us a solution to an odor that didn't exist and created an odor instead, which is called a foul. So basically, when I started, I discovered this when I started using reusable cloth pads, which is what the indigenous cultures did. And I realized that the blood does not smell, does not have an, that smell that we came to associate with the menstrual blood does not exist when you use either a cup to catch your blood or a reusable cloth pad or a sea sponge, anything that is natural and untreated will create no chemical reaction with your blood and will create no odor. So that's pretty interesting to find out. And all women that I work with, I tell this to. Some of them think it's gross. Well, to begin with, I thought it was gross to use cloth, but I became such friends with my body and with its discharges that it's not an offense. It's a natural way of caring for myself. Used to be, I'm not, I don't bleed anymore, but used to be. Now, women have internalized this taboo all over the world. The culture is grossed out by it. And women have internalized that grossness as if it's a reflection on themselves. Women have internalized also the expectation to perform like men, to be up and active and available and rearing to go every day of the month. I remember when I was growing up in Israel, there was an ad for a tampon company that said with our company, with our tampons, every day of the month would be the same. And I thought at the time that would be a good thing. And it's not because we're a cyclical being. We are like the moon. We expand and contract and we can't be the same every day of the month. And back to your question, women are not appreciating 
the fact that they need to move inward as much as expands. So if we are expanded and trying to perform like men and be out in the world social and active and working and engaged 30 days of the month, then the time when our body needs to rest and renew is the time the symptoms begin. For some women, it's the day before their period. Some women, it's the day of. It's around the beginning of the menstrual blood when the body is calling us to stop, to shut down and to go inwards and to recharge. It's like a, a depleted battery that needs to recharge. So you won't ask the battery when it's depleted, why are you denying yourself uh, being recharged? Because we want you to function. So the, the way for women to function is to allow themselves to go inward and renew themselves. And when we don't, our body begins to scream at us with symptoms. And the more we ignore, the more in conflict we are with the need to rest, the harder the body would cry at us. And I have worked with women all over the world that had symptoms, excruciating symptoms that were doubled over with pain and tried everything from conventional to alternative medicine and back again and nothing helped or nothing helped for longer until they realize there is an emotional component there is something else going on other than just physical and that's when they find me and we work on releasing the shame and the taboo and the internalized spam that our culture fed us about our blood and our cyclicity and when we clear that out and we can build ourselves back up then the symptoms disappear. In the old days, women were not banned, but encouraged to go retreat in the moon lodges and, and moon huts and red tents. When patriarchy became, began rising, there was a reversal of that. So instead of women being allowed to renew themselves, they couldn't change that time away, but they banished them. So it became, we can't, you, you're untouchable, you're unpure, you're unclean, go get into the red tent. So the practice of the withdrawing was too strong to abolish, but the interpretation from a reverence became a, a grossed out one, a taboo one, a put down one, which is very heartbreaking and it doesn't have to be this way. Tell me about some of your services that you offer, because like I said, I've worked with you and it has been a, a, a very beautiful and healing experience. Thank you. Working with you was a pleasure. And one of the aspects of my, my work that I love the most is working with women one on one, because that's the deepest shift and the deepest connection that I can make with women. I work with women in groups as well. I travel around the world and I work with groups on Zoom and far long distance. But working with women from anywhere in the world, one-on-one, -on -one, is the deepest bond and the deepest lasting solid change that we can make on her journey as a woman. So you can work with me by coming to my practice online, either via Zoom or via conference call. I offer a 20 minutes free phone consultation, a discovery call to invite you to look at what is your goal, where you are, where you want to be, and to map out the first steps that you can take towards that. So that's my one-on-one. -on -one. And then I have a womb academy and a red tent academy that I offer uh, intermittently online for women all over the world. And that it's all on my website. And I love to train women to not only reclaim their own cyclicity and their own power as women, but learn how to offer this empowerment to others. So there's the Red Tent Academy is offering women the training to be able to give this gift to other women in their lives, in their communities. And what is the greatest reward, would you say, that you receive from the work that you do? I would say the fact that menstruation is not as big of a taboo as it was 30 years ago. So in 1993, four, when I was starting this, the word menstruation was not utterable it was an unmentionable and now in 2015 the menstrual blood and tampons were on the cover of newsweek so women it's not all me single-handedly because other women were moved and called to do similar work but there was a few of us pioneers that started to sow the seed and plow the land and here we are 30 years later there are women 
all over the world that know what the red tent is, that hold red tents, that have empowered themselves, that have changed their lives, that are raising daughters without shame, without any problems with their menstrual cycle, but with a sense of pride and, and well-being in their cyclicity. And that's very rewarding. Okay, Diana, I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Buffy. It's my joy to be here with you today. 